Broadcasting live from the Business Radio X studio in Cumming, Georgia, it's time for FOCO Talks. Brought to you by the Forsyth County Chamber of Commerce. Well, welcome back to the uh, FOCO Talk series. We are uh, very glad you've tuned in to us uh, uh, this week. We have uh, 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 two very exciting guests uh, on today, and we're going to uh, cover some some interesting territory. So uh, we are joined again uh, by Senator Greg Dolezal, who's been with us in the past to talk about transportation. Uh, Senator Dolezal is uh, chair of the Senate Transportation uh, Committee and, and uh, is involved in many, many other committees, and we'll get into that in, in a little bit. And we are also joined by uh, someone who just completed his first term in the Georgia Senate, uh, Sean Still, uh, uh, Senator Still, and Senator Dolezal. Thank you both for joining us today. We're very glad to have you. Thanks for having us. Great. So let's let's jump in. Um, you know, uh, th- this last session. Um, gosh, it, 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 it. I mean, I know every session is is a roller coaster, um, and 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 uh, you never know. But especially, you know, going into an election year, uh, uh, that they especially are. But I wanted to start. I know um, Senator Dolezal, you have been a champion of school choice for many years. Um, likely, I think even before you were elected. So. Um, and, and I know it's been in a heavy lift. It's come up in several sessions, but this session it moved, um, and 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 got uh, 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 voted on by both the House and Senate. So, could you just give us uh, an, an an overview of the school choice bill and and how it's going to help Georgia? Absolutely, James. Thanks for having us here today. Uh, school choice essentially takes the state funding for our investment in education dollars that we fund on a per capita basis, a per student basis. It allows the parents to use those funds for an education opportunity outside of the public school system. So you, you mentioned this has been a roller coaster. Um, I presented this bill my freshman year, failed gloriously on the floor of the Senate, uh, failed gloriously last year on the floor of the House. So it was a certainly a celebration um, to see this cross the finish line. The, the nuts and bolts of the bill um, are such that it applies only to students in the bottom 25% of schools in the state of Georgia. So this would be a little foreign concept probably to us in Forsyth County, but there are schools in Georgia where you don't have a single fourth grader reading a grade level. And so for a lot of people, the zip code that they're born into determines their education outcome. And these are not parents currently who have the opportunity to give their student a different choice, their child a different choice, if they want to do that. And that's what this bill will do. Very good. So I I know in in the past, um, you know, there's been criticism of school choice um, c- coming from certain sectors that um, says that, you know, this is going to take money away from systems that, that badly need it, the, you know, poor performing systems, uh, and make uh, 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 those low performing s- systems have an even more difficult time uh, to improve. So h- how do you address those concerns or criticism, and, and is that addressed in the bill? It is. I think first and foremost, though, as investors, like I like the fact that we're on Business Radio X talking about our $13 billion investment annually into public education. And as business people, I don't look at this through the lens of how do we shore up systems. I look at this through the lens of what's best for students. As legislators and educators, if we put the child, the child at the centerpiece of our decision making, we often will arrive at different decisions than, well, we just do this because it's the way it's always been done. To answer your question specifically, uh, there's a guy, you probably know him, Jeffrey Dorfman, uh, was formerly a professor at uh, UGA, went on to become the chief economist for the state of Georgia, has since uh, left the state. But a couple years ago, he looked at all 180 school systems in the state, and what he discovered was that the marginal cost of a student in 178 out of 180 districts actually exceeded the state funding. So what happens, and I also like that I don't need to explain marginal cost on this podcast, by the way, <laughs> what, what happens when you remove the marginal cost, but in the funding actually is superseded by the marginal cost, you are left with more money per capita for the students who remain behind. So what we have seen in other states that have done school choice is we've seen educational op- uh, outcomes rise, not only for those students who remain in public school, but for those students who leave public school for whatever reason. And it may not be only education reasons that they may be leaving. It may be that they're getting bullied at school. It may be you know, a different reason where they just maybe don't connect with 
you know, a, a, a classroom of 30 students and one teacher. They may need something that's a little more tailorized, tailored and customized for them. So that's what this allows. This allows the parents and the students to be at the centerpiece of that choice. And I look forward, you know, this is only going to apply to about 20,000 kids a year when we roll it out. But I, th- I think that um, we're going to see significant shifts in the trajectory of life for some of these kids. And I'm excited to see that. And, and, and speaking along those lines, I mean, how, so what do you see happening in terms of uh, our ability to, to track that success and, and, and see how that's going so that, I mean, I'm, I'm sure over time these things will need to be tweaked and improved or expanded. So, so how, how, how will we know? How will we know if it's being successful? Yeah, so one thing that we have in the bill is we have annualized norm reference testing for every child that takes part in this program. What I find interesting about that, because that has been one of the other critiques too, is, oh, there's no transparency. And you get all these, you know, the same people that, that critiqued our special needs uh, school choice option that passed well before I got in the legislature. Some of them are still there and they're still telling the same kind of doom and gloom stories. They didn't come true the first time. They're not going to come true this time. But on the transparency piece, we actually have more testing for students, more frequent testing for students than we have in public school. So all four of our children, uh, my wife and my children, are in uh, public schools here in Forsyth County. My first grader didn't get tested this year. She didn't do the milestones. My kindergartner didn't do the milestones. But in this program, kindergartners and first graders would have standardized norm reference testing. that would give us visibility into um, which schools are performing and which ones aren't. Very good. Well, I know that was... Hard fought legislation and 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 your uh, your leadership got it across the mark and and thank you for that. So, so Senator uh, Still, uh, as I mentioned a moment ago, this was the end of your first term. Uh, so uh, uh, two sessions in, um, tell us a little bit, tell me a little bit about uh, you know what was the biggest surprise uh, and, and or the thing that you 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 were most surprised to learn uh, about your your first term in the Senate. That's kind of a loaded question because it, it could be uh, surprises about the development of a standalone bill or it could be how a bill morphs. So um, in addition to SB 233, I was carrying um, a, a different school choice bill, uh, SB 147. And so while Senator Dolezal's bill was focused on you know the voucher and to be able to use that so that, that parents could make financial choices on behalf of their children, Mine was a, a different kind of school choice bill altogether that would allow public school system to public school system open borders transfers. So whether it be in person or virtual, kids could leave from school system to school system without having to get permission from the home district superintendent. And what we had found that in some failing school districts, the kids were being essentially held hostage. And through the, uh, through the committee process and, and carrying that through, so that was a two-year bill to get across the finish line started first year in 23 and then carried it through this year, it had um, significant bipartisan support because we were leaving all the local dollars behind. QBE, you know, the equalization piece of it, the federal funding, the local dollars all stayed behind and it would only be that approximately $6,500 of state dollars that would transfer to help offset that cost. Um, And we were very clear that we were not going to bring forward my bill until we had gotten 233 across the, the finish line. And through just how quickly things pivot and change, my bill got absorbed into 233, which I was happy for it to do. But that was two years of fighting to carry a bill um, to fruition, to get it to the House, and then to watch it get amended into back into a Senate bill and then pass through that way. So the, um, the, the final version of 233 is not what Senator Dolezal initially had intended it was it was going to be a much cleaner bill. It picked up a few other bills along the way, um, but if if mine helped in some way, that's awesome. Um, I have never had pride in authorship. I just want to make sure that good legislation gets done. So that was a that that was a big um, shift for me because when legislative council publishes in a forty day period over four thousand bills or different versions of bills, so it's not four thousand distinct bills, right? But it could be amendments or anything else. It is impossible to keep up with the volume of paper uh, that, that's happening with that because things are just changing on the fly so fast, and we can only keep up with what's put in front of us in that moment. So, trying to you know be able to process and understand what, what's there, and then seeing how it applies, um, you know, to existing legislation, and and working with the the various bill authors on that. Very good. So, 
uh, <laughs> you know, I think the, the term sausage making, you know, the, you take all these different various pieces. Of course, that's also sort of the ideal scenario. You get a bunch of ideas on the table and pull out the ones that work best to, to get it done. So you know, congratulations on that. So um, I know you were uh, a, a driver of uh, some important legislation around human trafficking. And um, uh, so, so tell, tell us, so what, what does that, the legislation that you're driving, you're driving, um, what, what, what is the proposal of that? Uh, what would it do? So the first lady and the grace commission have made human trafficking their top priority for the last six years. And we are still one of the worst States in the country for trafficking. A lot of it is because of our port and because of our airport, uh, not to mention our, our highway system. And, um, while we're moving the needle a little bit in that area, we haven't made significant um, dents in that. So whether it's massage parlors, if it's human trafficking, if it's homeless children being trafficked, if it's something along the lines of um, things not being reported, underreported, whatever we were doing. So we created essentially an omnibus bill um, with huge bipartisan support that, that would have, um, and, and this was written um, with a Democrat from Atlanta, uh, Senator Jason Estevez, who's a, a dear friend, and he brought a piece into it. So essentially the bill would have done four things. Um, it would have ensured that we were not charging minors with um, sex trafficking criminality. Um, it would have expunged criminal records of people, uh, any crimes that were related to um, people while they were being trafficked. Um, it would have expanded the victims fund. So right now we have a, a victims fund called Safe Harbor uh, that is only for victims of human trafficking from zero to seventeen. The sad part is that our entire state budget for Safe Harbor is two hundred fifty thousand dollars. Period. Not per victim. That's all we have allocated in the state budget. So um, we would have expanded the victims fund to be all ages of people, any disenfranchised person, whether it was a child, whether it was an adult, uh, if it was somebody elderly uh, that was being uh, trafficked or, or used in some way for that, that it, we would have had resources for them. And then the, the fourth piece is that um, frontline hospitality worker training would have been mandatory CEUs um, for not just the employees of hotels, motels and, and uh, private lodging, but also, getting into the, the, you know, big detail on um, temp workers, you know, staffing agencies, they would have to do that as well. But we're going to do all this through the mechanism of civil forfeiture upon conviction. So Mm -hmm. after a trafficker was convicted, civil forfeiture, that money would go into this victim's fund to super fund the safe harbor and it's whopping $250,000 a year. And if we talk about the fact, the statistic that we have, Oh, and just in children alone, we have over 3,000 Georgia children trafficked annually. Wow. What can we do to move the needle on that? Because yeah. if we take $250,000 a year in, in state funds and divide that by 3,000 kids, we're not doing a lot. Yeah. So we're having to rely heavily on the NGOs to, to pick up the slack. But if we could use civil forfeiture and then redirect those dollars to the victim's fund, we could we could do that. So through all of that work, through six months of dedicated hard work on that, it passed unanimously. 100% of the Republican and Senate caucuses voted for it, went over to the House, got um, (laughs) re-tweaked. Re-engineered is what they call it over there. (laughs) Yeah, they they, they definitely (laughs) tried to re-engineer it. They they claimed that it was a um, a fiscal bill uh, because it it touched money. So after all that, we... um, reworked it into a House bill, passed it through the Senate again unanimously, passed twice unanimously through the through the state Senate as a House version and as a Senate version, gets to the House, uh, back for final approval, and we didn't get a cross-finish line on signing die, um, which was really, that was a tough blow because it yeah. didn't even get a chance to, to vote on. Yeah. Um, but ironically the legal community was completely on board with it. The prosecuting attorneys council, GACTL, the defense lawyers association, the trial lawyers association, everyone signed off on it. No one had beef with it, it which is kind of like crossing the streams in Ghostbusters. You don't ever want to get all those groups agreeing on something. And they all did. Um, 
we really thought it was going to be a you know pretty monumental thing. I had worked heavily with the, the governor's uh, policy team to make sure that, that we were checking all the boxes they were concerned with. Um, but it's one of those that didn't get across finish line. So that's, you, you can't give up when you've got yeah. a, a great piece of legislation like school choice. Yeah. You have to keep fighting for it and you got to yeah. just bring it back up next year. And, and, and I, I, were you expecting it, you know, next, next year, next legislative session to pick back, pick that back up and, and continue to drive? Oh, I will absolutely yeah. be driving yeah. with it on day Very one. Good. So uh, related to that, I know, um, you know, Atlanta, um, th- there's been a discussion in Atlanta for many years about uh, exactly what you were just talking about, Georgia being, you know, a, a, a human trafficking um, uh, center. And uh, so, you know, do you, based on this, not just this legislation, but just as a legislator, are we seeing progress in, in, in that fight? Um, are we... I know we clearly you know, still have a long way to go, but um, but over the years, I know legislation has been changed to help address it. Do you, do you see that, that we're making uh, some progress in that? I mean, I think every time we make progress, we make a big bust. We you know we we do a great door kicking um, event, or our incredible sheriff Ron Freeman has a you know a huge sting operation, takes you know twenty bad guys offline for trying to solicit minors. All those are great things, but they're getting more sophisticated and they're more sophisticated than we are. And the things that I learned in, in befriending all of our NGOs um, and talking to people that are what they affectionately refer to as door kickers, people that find victims and kick doors in to rescue um, people from being trafficked in these horrible situations. We are losing. And so we need more resources. We need more law enforcement against it. We have to be doing so, so much more and be leading on this and not be afraid to talk about it. And I think that it's one of those things that in polite conversations, people don't like to think about 3,000 Georgia students. And that's what they are. They're student-aged. Think about your your elementary, middle-aged son or daughter being trafficked. There are 3,000 annually. It's... When you compare it to, to drug dealers, you can sell a junkie a hit of whatever their drug of choice is. You can sell that to them one time. But a human being trafficked is what they refer to as a renewable resource because they can be yeah. trafficked over and over and over again, mm. 10 to 15 times a day. Mm. Well, that's, well uh, certainly in the next session, I, I, I'm very hopeful that, that that can be addressed. That is a huge issue. It's a, in, in um, and it's a huge economic issue. I mean, that is not uh, a, a moniker that Georgia uh, 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 needs to have around it, it, its neck, and I appreciate your, your effort to, uh, to push that. So um, I want to jump uh, back to Senator Dolezal. Um, you know, uh, I can't even begin to imagine what it must be like to serve as chair of the Transportation Committee and how what that does to, a, uh, to your daily schedule, especially as the, the, the session progresses. But... Um, I know a lot of great things happened for transportation this last session. The local uh, uh, mate road maintenance uh, uh, fund was was bolstered enormously. There's a lot of uh, some additional money for uh, freight and logistics, uh, w- which certainly from an economic perspective is, uh, perspective is huge. Um, I, I know just there was a lot of discussion about looking ahead. You know the the way that transportation dollars are funded uh, uh, has histo- historically been around uh, taxing gas and we're using less and less as uh, uh, the industry changes a great deal and um, electric, uh, electric vehicles and uh, alternative uh, fuel vehicles are, are being utilized. So what, when you look back at this session, you know, did you, are, are you most proud of around transportation? And then, and then looking ahead, what, what do you see in, in the future, especially in terms of, of funding? Yeah, the, the first question is pretty easy. Governor Kemp brought $1.5 billion to the table in what we call the baby budget, which we pass a budget before we come out of session for our fiscal year. When we come back into session the next year, we're about halfway through the fiscal year. So we're able to shore up that budget based on what revenues are actually doing as opposed to a revenue estimate. And you've probably heard, James, that the state's doing pretty well. And um, when small business and medium and large businesses in the state are doing well, when they do well, government revenues grow. And we have had surpluses the last few years. And I kind of kept 
hoping that we would see an increase in funding for transportation outside of the gas tax. And this year we saw that. Governor Kemp brought $1.5 billion to the table. I think it's important to frame that with some context. Uh, Our current gas tax revenues, obviously they vary a little bit year to year, but they're about $2.2 billion. Feds give us about another $1.8 billion. So let's just call it about $4 billion for the money that goes into roads and bridges in the state of Georgia. $4 billion is a lot of money. Uh, but the reality is that our need is a lot greater. Um, the 285-400 interchange that we all drive on now is cost a billion dollars. Um, Post Road is probably one of the most talked about roads locally that, need, that needs to be widened. It's a six and a half mile road that's going to cost $120 million. So that $4 billion gets eaten up pretty quickly. So the governor bringing $1.5 billion to the table allowed us to do a couple of things. It allowed us to make our first investment into freight and logistics. And we say freight and logistics, we're talking essentially about how do we get goods and goods out of the port and get them either into the state or through the state, because uh, we do have the second busiest port in America now. And how do we do that without creating a bottleneck for all the other commuter traffic that's happening? So that's going to mean new roads, new bridges, um, other options. And we think that's about a $90 billion need over the next 40 years is significant. So um, we made a $500 million start on that this year. Um, the other money went towards kind of the, re- the regular GDOT program, if you will, for things that are on the existing project list. Because one of the things that's happened with the economic success in the state is if you think about Rivian um, as just one example, or Hyundai, when we, when we win these big economic development projects, we go into that area and bolster the infrastructure. We build new interchanges, we widen roads. And what typically has happened is that's pushed other projects that were on the list off the list because we haven't had a way to sort of backfill that money. And so we backfilled that money this year. We put an additional $100 million this year into airport aid. Airports are not something that we probably often think about in terms of economic development, but they hold a crucial, they play a crucial role, not only in moving people, but moving packages and moving goods. And so we have underfunded roads and bridges and airports in the state. And so we have begun the step of addressing that with this $1.5 billion. The plan, if the economy allows us to do so, is to do that for two more years. And then our challenge, Chairman Jaspers on the House side and myself, is to figure out what to do after these next two years. How do we fund transportation moving forward? And that's an active conversation that's happening under the Gold Dome. Very good. Very good. Well, it's it's exciting, especially you know for for a chamber of commerce to be hearing about that kind of investment because um, you know so much of our economy um, is in the air uh, and on the roads, and uh, uh, especially in Forsyth County. I mean, it's 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 critical. So, um, so I know I, I also want to hit on um, uh, the, the immigration enforcement bill. Um, so. Uh, the, we, uh, we recently had hosted a, a legislative breakfast. This was discussed some there. Um, but I, I was really surprised to learn and just kind of keeping an eye on, on this bill from a distance that um, in, in, in Georgia, there there was no legal requirement for local law enforcement to um, to 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 enforce uh, federal law, immigration law and uh, to report. Uh, 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 when when they had uh, someone in custody who was uh, undocumented or here illegally, so um, can can y'all tell us a little bit about that bill um, and of what you think it should should really do and and um, and and how it's going to help Georgia? So, eleven oh five House Bill eleven oh five was was designed to. Make sheriffs uphold the law. And you really think about the the craziness that, that we have to say that out loud. But we have sheriffs that, that openly decide what they're going to enforce, what they're not going to enforce. And so in Forsyth County, we're spoiled. I think everybody kind of knows how great Forsyth County Sheriff's Office is. But to really take into perspective, they have less than 1% unemployment. Everyone is happy. People retire from Forsyth County. People pour into Forsyth County's um, sheriff's office to to retire from. They don't um, start the careers there and, and go somewhere else. People spend their entire careers there for a reason. Um, it's a great place to work. It's a safe place to work. And they have a sheriff that, that has their back. In contrast, immediately to our east in Gwinnett County, the sheriff there is the second largest sheriff's office in the, in the state. He campaigned on, was elected sheriff four years ago 
by not enforcing 287G, which is the immigration, um, Federal Immigration Act. So when you have a sheriff that says, I'm not going to enforce this, vote for me to be your sheriff, and he wins, great. What are the problems that come as a result of that? Businesses become less safe. Citizens become less safe. Unemployment in the sheriff's office skyrockets. It's, it's over 30% unemployment. I've heard from many employees, sheriffs, deputies, who have said that, that over half the force has now had to move out of county because of how unsafe it is for them to park their squad car in their front yard. And so now we're in a situation where four years later of not enforcing 287G and going back to the Wild West, that same sheriff is running for re-election. And there are digital billboards all over Gwinnett County that say promises made, promises kept. The promise is I'm not going to enforce 287G. The promise kept is I'm still not enforcing it. So when we look at that and we look at the, the increased levels of crime, we look at the employee endangerment of what's happening to the to the deputies out there and in the stress that all of them are under there is an absolute direct correlation to that so um i had great pride in voting yes on that bill so that we can actually ask our sheriffs we didn't need another law about it but we had to create a law to hold them accountable and to make them actually do their job so that was that was great for the business community because we believe that it's going to force um, sheriffs that are essentially becoming sanctuary cities and counties yeah. to, to tighten things up significantly. Yeah, I, I, it was uh, um, eye-opening uh, to, to, to see the, the, the idea of uh, having to legislative re, legislatively reinforce the idea of rule of law. Uh, and, and that was uh, uh, I- impressive. Um, so, um, you know, one of the uh, uh, things that that often uh, can get you overlooked is, you know, things that, that make it through just fine and get uh, uh, put in place. And then the things that don't, um, they, that doesn't get quite as much attention. And, you know, um, Governor uh, uh, Kemp had, you know, vetoed a, a number of, of bills. Um, he vetoed uh, suspending the tax break for data centers using uh, Hope Scholarship dollars for uh, graduate students. Um, he uh, tuition grants for nurses, uh, but he also vetoed a bill increasing the homestead exemption from two thousand to four thousand um, dollars, citing a, a possible clerical error. Um, so, I, you know that 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 my understanding is it had been um, decades since the homestead exemption uh, had been touched. And um, can can you all walk us through kind of what what really from your perspective what happened with that and. And what um, and can we expect to see this coming back? Yeah, so there were really two. Let me let me back up a step. If you were elected to the General Assembly in the last three years, you heard some commentary, and I'm going to say significant commentary from your constituents about property taxes. It didn't matter if you were in Gilmer County or Forsyth County or Fulton County or Fannin County. You heard about rising property taxes. In our cases here locally, we were seeing as much as thirty to forty percent increases year over year. And we began to see people taxed out of their homes, which is something I think that we would all agree uh, that if we're going to be in the business of taxing unrealized gains, which is what we're doing when we tax property, um, that we need to have some throttles on that. So we actually, um, the local delegation passed a a local floating homestead exemption bill last year that we'll vote on, uh, that will be on the ballot this November. But there was really two parallel tracks in how the House and Senate were trying to address this on 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 a uniform basis statewide. And the House, uh, under Speaker Burns' leadership, was working on addressing what you're talking about, which is the standard homestead exemption, which was $2,000. And they were looking to increase that to $4,000. That doesn't mean it'd be a $2,000 deduction in your property tax bill. That just means that you're, you're, the, the amount that they subtract from your assessed value would increase by $2,000. So it would have been a, a, a modest uh, reduction, probably somewhere between $50 and $150, depending on the taxing jurisdiction that you were in. But it was a good step. As that bill made its way through the Senate, we actually increased it with support from the Speaker in the House to $10,000. In the, the f- flurry of getting all these bills moved, um, 
it got moved back to four thousand dollars in the process in the uh, for for the bill, but the constitutional amendment because it required to change the constitution never got changed from the ten to the four. So you would have had uh, this vote on ten thousand dollars, even though the enabling legislation was at four. So it was a clerical error. Now. I think the most significant but least talked about bill that passed this General Assembly was a Senate measure. I actually co-sponsored it, Sean, I I think that as well, uh, that actually moved as a House bill because we substituted it out in some of the last-minute interplay between the House and the Senate. But it put a statewide floating homestead exemption in place. And it did that based on the rate of inflation. So if CPI is 2.5%. Your property tax bill can't go up by more than 2.5%. If CPI is 7%, it can't go up by more than 7%. What it does locally, though, is it allows more restrictive floating homesteads. So, for example, the Forsyth County has on the county side, it doesn't allow any increase once you've claimed homestead on the county M&O portion of the tax bill. That will still remain in place. The 4% that we passed, hopefully will pass locally this year, uh, that the voters will approve, will be another throttle so that even if CPI does push to 7%, that 4% for the school portion will remain in place. But we wanted to address this not just for the county, but to address this statewide. So I think part of what happened is the Senate kind of had their idea, the House had their idea. We ultimately passed both of them. And then in the process of doing that, we just missed something on the on the on the yeah. um, what would best be described as a cler- clerical error. I suspect I have not spoken directly with the speaker about this, but I I know that was important to him. I know we were supportive of that in the Senate, so I would expect to see that come back and move you. again next year. Good, very good. Uh, yeah, it's certainly something we discuss a lot in Forsyth County, and and certainly it'd be some great benefit to that. So, um, you know, something that is very important to to business community and has been for a long time. I know the Georgia Chamber has actually developed a whole the vision of the chamber dedicated to, to tort reform. And, and I know it's been, a um, you know, the, maybe the, the, on the, the, the heaviest end of heavy lifts, but, um, there's been some, some examples recently of, uh, some r- really, uh, I- incredible, um, uh, 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 financially at least incredible, uh, outcomes to lawsuits, uh, in Georgia, most, uh, recently the, CVS example of, um, uh, well, I get into details of it because we want to talk about the tort reform itself, but but some egregious examples of, of just abuse uh, of, of the system. So, um, and, and, and we as consumers uh, pay the price for that, and certainly business people are paying the price for that. Is, is real tort reform in Georgia something that you can see on the horizon um, in, in the next, you know, session or, or sessions? I see it on the horizon, James, but I've seen it on the horizon for six years. And I think that if you probably want to think about the best microcosm example of competing interests at the Capitol and kind of how the lobbying back and forth can move and how things become very unpredictable, it is tort reform. You know, all of us talk about the reality that Site Selection Magazine has named Georgia the best place to do business for the last 11 years. What we don't campaign on is there's another magazine that for the second year in a row named Georgia the number one judicial hellhole in America. And what I like to say is that I don't think those two things can live on a parallel track for too long. Something has to give. And what I would prefer to give is that we remain the number one state to do business because we have some sort of tort reform that happens. Now, whether I think that that needs to include things like uh, premises liability, which is a bill that I carried this year, things like direct action, which was a bill that Sean carried last year. I also think we need to look at phantom damages, this idea that you have damages that aren't realized by the victim but somehow get awarded by a jury. I think you need to talk about that. So what we have heard is uh, a number of problems as it relates to rising insurance costs. We have insurance companies leaving the state so that trucking companies um, only have three options of who can insure them. You may say, well, I'm not a trucking company. I don't care. If you have something that shows up at your front door from Amazon, you should care. Um, if you are in the, in the business of moving anything, I talked to John Alvord, who's a, a friend of mine here locally. He owns North Georgia Brick, yeah. largest brick, yeah. dri- brick distributing company. And they are a quasi-trucking company. Um, and so he's like, the number one issue to me is this tort reform piece because my insurance costs are going through the roof. And when that happens, my, co- my fees go through the roof. And if you want to talk about a rising housing problem, it's, it, there's a lot of things in the mix. But one of the things in the mix is, the, is the, the cost of trucking. My premises liability bill this year got out of committee for the second year in a row, never made it to the floor because as we began to count, we, we knew that we couldn't pass the bill. But that was a, it's a negligent uh, third-party security bill. 
that basically tries to prescribe some sort of fault to a crime if it happens on a property to the criminal. Yeah. Novel idea <laughs> that you don't just hold the landowner yeah. responsible if something happens, but this affects everyone from CVS to Waffle House to anybody who owns commercial property, really to anyone who owns any property, which would include homeowners. That what do you do if somebody comes on your property unbeknownst to you and commits a crime? What is your level of responsibility? And we have seen, uh, we saw in the Six Flags case, we saw the crime not even happen on Six Flags property. People get in a fight, they leave, they go mm-hmm. off site, they leave Six Flags, they go fight somewhere else. And they are, it, the jury finds that Six Flags is 88% responsible for the damages that were done and the fault mm-hmm. that was done in that crime. And so I think that reasonable people can agree that that's something that we need to look at legislatively. Governor Kemp has, has signaled, um, well, we actually passed a bill that we're going to study um, kind of what the impact is to, to costs on, on, on businesses and, and property owners in the state and what we can do. But what we know is that we've got kind of this jackpot justice system that has emerged where you have uh, people going in front of juries and getting awarded these nuclear verdicts that, that have a lot of problems. They create food deserts. So you yeah. see instances where... Uh, either convenience stores or gas stations are up and leaving certain high crime areas because like we don't want to take on the liability. Yeah. So this is something really that Democrats and Republicans should link arms on. Uh, the reality is that due to some of the forces that are at play at the Capitol, um, you basically have the business community versus the trial lawyers, just to kind of call it what it is. Um, and there's a lot of, there's a lot of ca- campaign donations that, that go on that, in my opinion, sway the votes. And that's something that we need to we need to figure out. The business community, and I'm going to put a little plug in here. When John and Zach Alvert took me to lunch last year, and I was already on the, the, the tort reform train, but when they took me to lunch as local business owners in my community and said, this is an important issue yeah. to me, it mattered to me. Yeah. And so for other business owners in other communities around the state, if they would call their legislator and go to lunch and say, hey, this is an important issue to me, and begin to tell their story, it puts some skin on the bones of why we need this. And I think that for a lot of people, this is some ethereal idea. Mm-hmm. But when you meet a John and a Zach and, you, and they tell you this has become a major problem for us, it's like, well, this is why I was elected. I was elected to solve problems. So let's go solve this problem. And, and well, that, that hits exactly at a question I was going to ask really both of you, and that is what, what you would recommend business people to do to get in, involved in it, something we certainly hear a great deal about. So Senator Still. To, to follow to what Greg said, you've got to get involved. Businesses are so concerned about everything from insurance to tax, taxes, licensure, whatever it is that, that helps them run their day-to-day business. The trial lawyers, the guys that have all the, the TV ads and the, the billboards up and down the interstates, they are focused on one thing and that one thing only, and that is allowing them to get the biggest damages to, to go after the, the largest amounts, whether it's medical malpractice, whether it's trucking industry. I mean, the, the number of billboards that are out there right now saying that the trial lawyers that, that focus, personal injury attorneys, that, that focus solely on the trucking industry. You don't have to own a trucking company to be affected by that. Every consumer mm-hmm. feels that. So the business community is losing, and we're losing hard. The, the number of lobbyists at the Capitol right now GTLA, the Georgia Trial Lawyers Association, had 11 full-time lobbyists on the floor. In contrast, the Georgia Chamber had three. Yeah. And they're, they're covering a wide variety of issues, whereas the trial lawyers are only focused on just a handful of bills, and they're hammering that day in and day out. And it's not a Republican-Democrat thing. There, there are people on both sides of the aisle. There are just very few fiercely, violently pro-business legislators Two of them happen to be sitting in the, in the studio right now. But there are we are a shrinking minority of people that are willing to go to bat and fight for that every day. Very so. good. Um, outside of, um, you know, just reaching out to legislators, I mean, is there any, anything else that business people ought to be doing, I mean, uh, uh, to engage in this? I know it's not always, uh, you know, it's, 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 it's usually one of those things that's not an issue until it is. Um, but but it, anything else that you'd recommend that, that we as a business community could be doing better to to get that out there? I, I do think that the lunch and the one-on-one is important, but I, I think there's also opportunity for members to be invited to board meetings. By members, I mean legislative members of the General yeah. Assembly to be invited to board meetings of businesses to yeah. have a conversation. I think for trade associations to engage mm-hmm. with their members. I think for local businesses to bring 
members in and have conversations with their staff about how this is important to yeah. them. So I, I you know, it, it is, it's one of these things that, that I think is difficult for kind of the average voter to engage in because they don't necessarily live in the world. They're not getting sued every day, thankfully. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But they do know that they're seeing their insurance costs go up. They know they're seeing the cost of materials go up. And this, this is a, it is a part of it. I think that the other side of it, though, too, is we want to ensure that people still have the opportunity to get justice. So what does it look like? Much of what government should be doing is engaging in the process of balancing rights. We have this First Amendment, right? But you also can't go scream fire in a movie theater. So that's a balancing of rights thing. I also think that in the tort reform, it is the balancing of rights. Yeah. What does it mean to balance justice and ensure that Lady Justice keeps the blindfold on, that there's not a perverse financial incentive for people to go in and bring frivolous lawsuits. You know, Todd Jones is another person locally that had a bill that addressed what we call third-party litigation funding, which is essentially there are hedge funds that are formed yeah. for the sole purpose of funding lawsuits of other people. And all that Todd wanted to do was require that to be disclosed so that, because a lot of times what you see is you'll win a verdict, right? But there's, there's a hedge fund behind it and they'll fund the 12-month appeal process and they'll just continue to drain the defendant dry. And, and, w- and withhold whatever judgment may be for a prevailing, um, in, in the business case, um, either somebody who's being sued or is suing. And so when you have intellectual property at play, and this is what Todd got into, and you have, let's just say hypothetically, uh, a, one of our technology companies getting sued, say that it's Apple getting sued, and they're being sued by a company that's backed by China, mm-hmm. you then begin to get into some national security issues. And so these kinds of things should be disclosed. And so that's a bill that Todd had. He got he got smashed in committee um, by the lawyers that were in the room. It was in the Judiciary Committee, of which Todd is a member of. And I think that he got two or three votes in favor of just this idea of disclosing whether or not there are third parties funding this litigation. You know where the money and comes that's, from. That's exactly right. Yeah. Well, uh, we have come to the end of our time, and I, I want to thank you both. And, and I really want to close by also saying um, uh, thank you. I know this did not get a ton of attention uh, at, at the time, um, but, but our community, uh, not just the chamber, but, uh, but, but others in the community, the county, and, and uh, the city, had two bills uh, in, in front of you all, um, and, and uh, one was on redevelopment powers. The other uh, addressed uh, uh, the hotel motel tax and uh, change, making a change to that. Uh, and, and both of those bills passed. You carried that in the, the, the Senate, and I thank you both for that. And uh, uh, those are, are two bills that were very important to us locally. Um, they, they, they are today, and they will be for the foreseeable future. So uh, thank you for your support on that and uh, um, being a great partner. Senator Still, I know that this probably will be uh, airing just past voting, but if you want to make a difference— There are 178,858 registered voters in Forsyth County. As of last night, 10,220 people have really voted. 5.71% of our total electorate have voted. If we're going to make a difference, we need more than 5.5% to turn out. Very good. Very good. Amen. (laughs) It is shocking. Uh, You know, sometimes you drive around my neighborhood and and I take it for granted that, you know, hey, these are all folks that, you know, are like me. They're involved and engaged. And and then you sit around the pool, uh, which our pool just opened this weekend, and um, I was proselytizing about it being a vote on Tuesday. Y'all got, you've got to go make it. But uh, then you find out in a hurry that uh, that is not the case. But you're absolutely right, Senator Still. That's that's a good a good way to end uh, our, our session today. Thank you both so much. And, and I know uh, serving in office is a hard, hard road to hoe. And I, I thank you both for doing it. It is uh, much appreciated. Uh, we will uh, uh, be back in a few weeks with uh, another FOCO Talks podcast.